This is my first talk on DevCon. This is my second time I'm attending DevCon, first time presenting. And English is also not my native language, okay? So I would like to share my story about uh, how I got into tech, uh, how I got here to present here. Uh, I'm a former outreach intern from the past winter and current junior software developer in cancer research. Well, and I would like to cover uh, what did I learn as an outreach intern, what I found particularly useful for finding a job, how did it feel to go through a job interview, and how it actually felt to start as a fresh junior. Um, so first I would like to introduce myself. Uh, I come from the non-tech background. Uh, I come from the research in life sciences chemistry. My first contact with programming was uh, when I was making my PhD thesis. I did all my statistics in R, which discouraged me from programming for quite a while. Well, then I started a family, as you can see on the picture. This was me already doing the PhD thesis. And then, you know, to provide you a little bit more context, I come from Czech, and we historically stay quite a long time with the kids at home, up to three years, for every child. This is something what people out of Czech Republic might not know. So there was, um, when I had the first child, I started to think what I'm gonna do, because that's a long time, and I couldn't work in the lab. So, <laughs> well, coding is something what you can do even with a child from the sofa from home. So I started. I picked Python because that's the most easy language I learned that there is. <laughs> um, I was piling up courses. Here's a picture of me <laughs> and my second child holding the uh, cable of the headphones like an umbilical cord, so she was happy. Uh, I, I had uh, some time to calmly do the courses. Well, after some time, the <laughs> I just felt that I'm piling up courses and not getting anywhere. I was just doing my pet projects and uh, I was thinking where, when, when I'm gonna do something real. Like, um, I just didn't see any perspective an anymore after, after two years of doing courses. Then I learned about Autrici and that meant going from my pet projects to something what does the, the working on a software which had community, which had its, its maintainers, and which has its own processes. It was finally something real. Well, how many of you is familiar with what Outreach is? And how many of you are uh, interns, past or current? <laughs> and how many of you are uh, mentors? Good, so everybody quite, quite knows what Outreach is. We just uh, like to say that Outreach matches interns with mentors and uh, mentors from free and open source communities and uh, provides support for, for, for the project. Um, after registration and passing the eligibility check, uh, I could see all the projects. Uh, there is actually a lot of projects. One can easily get lost in it. There are some low level, there are some high level. You can basically pick whatever from programming, uh, documentation, translations. Well, and I picked my project was uh, to make a command line interface tool for Pagur. How many of you is familiar with what Pagur is? Like about half. So Pagur is a uh, well, it has its definition, <laughs> which didn't tell me much. I would describe it as uh, it's something like GitHub, but it's uh, completely open source. It's written in Python, and it's uh, operated in the open. That means that you can see all the issues. You can see the pull requests. Uh, you can see the discussions on the public IRC channels. You can see the developers. Um, talking, discussing the features and the approach. And um, you can actually see sometimes that they are not sure about something. They sometimes, even the most senior people can struggle and can reach out to ask others for help. 
And this is something very encouraging for somebody who is just a beginner, because if you see advanced people asking, then you as a beginner, you're even more encouraged to do so. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Actually, this is not what happened in my project. In, in my project in Pagur, everybody was very decent and nicely discussing. Um, well, with uh, the, yeah, these are my my uh, project was uh, named Crank, the Common Line Interface Tool, and um, I also wanted to say that Outreach provides a travel allowance, which allows you to go to some conferences and to meet the people which you just know from the um, IRC forums, which you know just a, like a nickname, see them in person to talk with them, not only of your projects, but uh, of the neighboring projects which are part of the larger community. And you can finally put a face into anonymous nickname on the IRC channel. Well, without Richie, what was the main takeaway is that I developed a strong attitude toward, towards free and open source software, which I'm advocating since. And um, and I also learned that you're expected not only to contribute to your project, but if you, with your project you usually influence, you need to, to adjust maybe some other dependencies, some other libraries, you expect to also uh, contribute to those if you can. Like for example, by um, reporting a bug, or even creating a pull request, or starting the discussion, or offer uh, a code review, or, uh, or verify or test somebody else's bug fix. Um, well, the carrot is there because I usually name my testing projects after vegetable. So I, I just immediately know that it's a testing project if it's some kind of carrot or leak or, or something like that. Um, well, and then slowly, um, uh, when I was done with Outreach, I knew what the next logical step is. That was finding a job. But I was not sure whether I'm ready to do so already. Well, and I would say that the key here, which helped me the most, was to find my local coding communities in my, in my uh, city. Well, um, in my case, living in Barcelona, uh, there's a lot of different communities. There's a wide range. Basically, every programming language has its own meetups there. And I picked PyLadies with which I had already experienced here from Brno, which <laughs> uh, done by really amazing people. And uh, they define themselves as international mentorship group with a focus on helping more women become active participants and leaders in the Python open source community. Well, there's a quite uh, different approach between the communities. For example, here in Brno, and I think whole Czech Republic, it's taken more like uh, courses for beginners, which are led by already professionals. While in uh, Barcelona and in many other cities, it's done um, like there is a meetups and workshops already for professionals. But beginners are also invited, but they obviously are the smaller part of the community. Uh, they meet uh, once a month and. Um, after the meetups and the talks, uh, there is some socializing, there is usually some free food, and you, you can just make your uh, local network. The other um, local coding community I was attending was Code Bar, which defines themselves as a non-profit non initiative that facilitates the growth of diverse tech community by running regular programming workshops. How it works, they meet, every second week and uh, I was quite surprised by their approach because they take a little bit differently. Uh, it's very much focused on networking. That means that we make a circle and everybody introduces it himself or herself 
and you're supposed to say what you want to learn or what are you able to teach. After that, the study, study groups uh, form. Usually, uh, usually it's like one coach on one student, sometimes two students, so it's really personal experience. And you can either follow their uh, prepared tutorials or you can come up with your own project and this is really great because you have somebody who is there two hours for you just solving your stuff, which is which, what, I, what I never experienced before and I found it really helpful. And what is really great on this is that uh, the meetups happen every time in a different tech company. So you go to that company, you see the surroundings and the people from that company are always involved in the meetup. That means that you can get them as coaches and you can network with them. You finally end up, after several weeks visiting several companies, you end up here and there knowing people personally and they also end up knowing you. Um, and there is another thing which I found really awesome is that uh, they kind of, mm, it's not only one closed community in the city, they tend to visit each other from different cities. So sometimes we get a visitor from Norway or, or from another, another country, and that's very enriching because we see how it works in a, in a different city, in a different continent. That, that's really great. And also when you're traveling and you see that, hey, in this, in this city there is a code bar session, maybe I can go there. And you have already somebody to talk to, to socialize. And that was really great. These are some pictures from Code Bar. And um, in these meetups also I found, uh, I met a lot of women in uh, different stages of their career from very different backgrounds. And, and I could uh, network with them. And I saw and I heard stories, which I found very useful. Well, after, and uh, the most important thing of of uh, these meetups is that they usually have a mailing list where people are posting job offers. Whether I was, uh, and I was not really sure if I'm already ready to apply, but I was reading them just to know um, what is usually required from a junior, from a senior. Well, I was just checking the junior ones, but uh, like um, if I'm missing something from the knowledge or from the skills which uh, are usually required. and. Uh, one day, I just saw such a job offer which played on my soft spot to the research. And uh, I decided that I'll take that little step and I will, for me it was a big step, for me it was a huge leap. And um, I'll try to apply. Mainly because I didn't really believe that it could work. I just um, wanted to start practicing interviews because that is something what you can practice a lot and the, be and the personal experience is the best. So I was preparing for, my, for the worst option that could have happened, that was a whiteboard interview. I studied what kind of questions there could be and so on. Finally, it was not that difficult. <laughs> uh, I went through two turns of interviews. One was just a um, compatibility check with, uh, with the boss and with the team members where we were just testing if we can we can communicate if, if there is the if it works if we are of the similar mindset and uh, the second one was a tech interview where I was supposed to solve a simple programming challenge and uh, to create an image and build a container in Docker I think and it worked and I landed in my first job as a junior software developer at Institute for Research in Biomedicine in Barcelona and in its biomedical genomics lab. Uh, this is us. You can see that uh, there's more women than men. <laughs> and uh, it's a research group dedicated to computational study of cancer at the genomic level. And I learned that some of them actually quite quite uh, more uh, of my colleagues are uh, either organizers or active participants of some Python, um, Python Barcelona meetups. 
that's probably how it got to the mailing list. Well, here I thought that I actually wanted, no, I had a job, but <laughs> that was like, this was actually the hardest part of it all. Like, um, there was very few things I knew and a whole library of things uh, I needed to know. And uh, I got, yeah, there was a who knows uh, how, what, what uh, do you need for uh, bioinformatics. So there is a lot of pandas, there is a lot of singularity, there is a lot of mm, obscure bioinformatical tools and even weirder file formats which you're supposed to deal with. And um, I was just going to work and sleeping <laughs> and I had completely zero personal life. This is me every afternoon taking the kids to the playground where they were full of energy and I just couldn't anymore. Well, but after weeks and uh, some months, the pieces started slowly to fall in place and I was slowly started to be able to contribute. And the good thing I saw happening here was that I brought the good stuff, which I learned participating in the open source project, to my work. And I was able to propose changes and uh, bring the good practices I learned. And I started finally to feel useful. Um, that's all. But we have a little bit of time. So if you came here to actually learn something about cancer research and you're disappointed that you didn't learn anything. So I uh, prepared, uh, mm, this is the project I'm working on. It's called Cancer Genome Interpreted. I'm working on a second version of it. And it's basically an open platform designed to support the identification of tumor alterations that drive the disease and detect those that may be of mm, therapeutical relevance. How does it work? We, um, well, somebody, somebody in the lab sequences a tumor that provides us a file with a lot of mutations. Well, every tumor has a, I don't know if thousands, but many mutations, but not all of them are actually relevant. Uh, majority actually is not. More than nine of ten of these mutations are of uh, unknown significance. And we have tools which, um, which uh, we are able, with which we are able to distinguish which of the mutations are drivers. That means that they can drive the tumorigenic uh, activity, they can start cancer, and which of them are just passengers, or something between, or they are, of, uh, they, they are weak predicted. And this leads the um, how's it go? Um, like a personalized drug prescription. Basically, uh, our um, the cancer genome interpreter is used either by uh, clinical oncologists or by researchers. That just uh, by running this analysis, they get a list of uh, of the of, pres of prescription of drugs which work on those particular mutations which are identified as drivers in that particular tumor. And that makes uh, the, the decision much faster. Well, in the database we have uh, more than, uh, oh, well, almost 800 uh, cancer genes and uh, 5,600 validated oncogenic <coughs> mutations. There would be much more of them identified if there would be more money in the research. <laughs> Usually it's driven by the government, so. Uh, they are doing what they can, and there is more than uh, now there is more than 246 cancer cancer types. And if you want to hear some uh, <laughs> some cancer facts, which I found uh, really interesting, is that there is uh, about a thousand mutations which happen in a cell every day, which is not much, and there are some repair mechanisms, but if you multiply it by the amount of uh, cells in the body, that makes uh, the risk of you getting cancer much higher. But uh, it's, like, it's basically like rolling the dice. You never know where the mutation is going to fall. 
And uh, the, more, the more times you're rolling the dice, the more likely, the, in the bigger danger you are that uh, the mutations will fall in the bad places. Like one mutation is not gonna cause anything probably, but three already can. And three is quite low number to start, something, something like this. Well, and yeah, <laughs> if you're interested even more, so um, sometimes I learn about even things which I didn't really want to learn. You can read it yourself. <laughs> um, which questions do you have? Am I what? I <laughs> I think we're on quite, we're on the high, highest capacity, like uh, our lab is able to, to, to help of people, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a hiring manager. Yeah, that's right. Like we, re we recently hired like three or five people, so I think we're on the ceiling now. So I see it's more like and the second question is more on open source. And uh, usually each open source community has some people who are building the practice, but they are not very patient with the cleanups. Have you ever experienced somebody like this? And how do you manage how uh, you manage to do it uh, so you don't get discouraged from continuing the system? I'm not sure if I heard it properly. Like uh, if the people from our lab uh, are... No, 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 you're right. In, in a general lab, you're, you're a part of the open source world and all your projects you participate in. Sometimes it happens that there's a developer who's brilliant, but he doesn't have much patience to wait for the beginners. So, I mean, it's very hard to push your code to the loop, to the number, and, and uh, how to build it. Uh, how, do you, how do you develop with this kind of jobs? Uh, if I met uh, during my uh, open source contributions with, uh, with somebody who would be um, who would not be too supportive, and exactly. I was actually pretty lucky in this. So if I if I went too crazy, so people politely told me, but I really didn't feel like discouraged. It's very really lucky. But what it really is a community. <laughs> okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you.